The Collapse of the American Whig Party The American Whig Party was founded in the middle of the 19th century, and it was short-lived. The party was created primarily as an opposition movement to President Andrew Jackson's policies and the Democratic Party. The roots of the party were on former National Republicans and even some Federalist movements that remained. Like Federalists, Whigs were pro-national government and wanted the continuation of a national bank. The party seated four presidents but declined and was eventually wiped out. Let's analyze three different theories on the collapse of the Whig party and the reasons behind it in a clear and precise manner. The first one being that the Whigs were not unified or ideological as a party, the second theory Taylor's nomination and presidency and the final one puts the emphasis on the expansion of slavery as the main cause of the Whigs' demise. The first theory historians use for the collapse of the party was the lack of a unified political ideology and a strong platform within the party. This line of thinking shows the Whig party as a weak and fractured party from the start. Of all the parties that have existed in the United States, the famous Whig party was the feeblest in ideas. Gallatin, 1879. Most historians that follow this theory believe the Whig party to have been a political force lacking a true ideology that united his members. The early historians thought that the Whigs were unimportant and ineffective. The Whigs suffered greatly from factionalism throughout their existence, as well as weak party loyalty that stood in contrast to the strong party discipline that was the hallmark of a tight Democratic Party organization. The Whig party never was a homogeneous party and was essentially divided into two main factions, the Conscience Whigs, based in northern states, and the Cotton Whigs, based in southern states. While the consciences were noted for their moral opposition to slavery, their cotton opponents were more conservative, whose close association with the New England textile industry led them to emphasize the slavery issue and focus more on economic policies. It was believed for a long time that Whigs were merely elitist businessmen and bankers that formed with the sole purpose to advance their agenda and were in contrast with the Jacksonian ideals of small government and state rights. Voting pattern studies have shown Whig support of banks, limited liability for corporations, prison reform, educational reform, the abolition of capital punishment, and temperance. Although the Whig party was never a truly anti-slavery party it obtained the support of free blacks and abolitionists when compared with the radical pro-slavery Democratic Party under Jackson. The Whig party was so diverse in their platforms and issues they supported that some research uses this argument to justify the division during the 1836 presidential election that cost them a victory. The Whig party according to this theory was spread too thin and failed to have a concrete unifying ideology. Some examples of voting records and archives show that the Whigs were known to vote as a bloc against Democrats in Congress, proving that at some level the party did have some sort of unification at least in the early stages. In Congress, Whigs were strong supporters of the Second Bank of the United States, high tariffs, distribution of land revenues to the states, relief legislation to mitigate effects of the panics of 1837 and 1839, and federal reapportionment of House seats. This shows that an argument could be made that Whigs had some unification after all. The fall of the Whig party began with the decision to appoint Southern General Zachary Taylor as a presidential nominee. The Whigs were known for their opposition to the war and Taylor was a popular and well-known general during the Mexican-American War. It seemed almost ironic for the party to choose Taylor to be the nominee for the election. This is the opinion of historian and professor Gil Troy in his article where he explained his thoughts on the choice, at first glance, a general seemed to be a strange choice for the Whigs. Founded in the 1830s as a strained coalition of southern states' rights conservatives and northern industrialists united mostly by disgust at Andrew Jackson's expansion of presidential power, the Whig Party considered the war a disastrous result of presidential overreach. The Whigs gambled that Taylor's celebrity and broad public appeal would outweigh his lack of strong political conviction and help them compete against the Democratic Party, but Taylor was neither political nor experienced in government. He was also an unexperienced and pro-war southern slave owner and had mainly the support of only southern faction of the Whigs and was not liked by most northern Whigs. Taylor emerged to be a terrible president and he disregarded the Whigs' agenda. Taylor's nonpartisan, disloyal, and hostile stance against his own party began to deepen the already fragile party unity. Henry Clay said of Taylor's nomination, I fear that the Whig party is dissolved and that no longer are there Whig principles to excite zeal and simulate exertion. 
running a war hero mocked the Whigs' anti-war long-standing platform and running a slaveholder failed to calm the emboldened and growing faction of abolitionists within the party ranks. Taylor was not prepared to manage these internal party battles once elected, making him the last Whig president to be elected into office. This brings us to the final theory and the most popular one. The Whig party collapsed because of the expansion of slavery and the political conflicts of the new territories acquitted during the Mexican-American War. Millard Fillmore after Taylor's death became president and the final days of the Whig party began. By endorsing the Compromise of 1850, Fillmore believed that he was only putting the interests of national unity over the selfish desires of northern Whig opponents to slavery. However, his theory was proved wrong and in fact, his endorsement finalized the fracture of the Whig party by triggering the exodus of support to other parties, particularly the newly formed Republican Party. The North and South had become so polarized over the slavery issue that the Whigs were no longer able to make a broad national appeal on the basis of unalterable attachment to the Constitution and the Union. Like they had before. They no longer had Jackson as a common enemy to rally behind and they lacked the ability to be a governing party. Suddenly the main social problem that Whigs were always happy to ignore had become the turning point of the nation's political debate and Whigs could no longer rally behind economic policies as a platform without being affected. The Whigs like the Democrats were always happy to downplay slavery as an issue and choose to debate the Democrats on other issues they considered more important like trade, tariffs, and economic policies. The abolitionist movements in the country as a result had no major representation in politics being the reason why several parties formed over the few years the Whigs were in power, after the Republican Party attracted northern Whig voters the party began the rapid collapse that led it to be crushed in the midterms right after they elected a president into power. A good number of southern and northern Whigs tried to save the party by remaining unified but after the Kansas-Nebraska controversy, it became even harder to save the party. The Whigs were seen as weak for compromising and giving in to the Democrats in the eyes of the North. The surge of new political parties like the Republican Party gave voters a different option to cast their vote of anger against the Democratic Party, hence fracturing the Whigs even more and killing them as a party after the midterm elections of 1854 when the party lost the majority of seats in Congress. The Whigs were not equipped to deal with the expansion of slavery because the party was not ideologically sound and had many factions. The Whig Party had anti-slavery and pro-slavery members, making it impossible for the party to unify behind a platform on slavery expansion. The anti-slavery wing of the party began to shift towards the newly formed Republican Party. The clearest example of the shift was Abraham Lincoln, a former Whig himself that would eventually be a Republican president. The remaining Whigs made several attempts to find common ground and maintain the party alive but it was clearly not an option after the Republicans gave anti-slavery Whigs a platform that they agreed on and gave abolitionist voters a different party to support. The Whigs were never truly a national party, they were at best an opposition grouping lacking a common purpose. A group that lacked common purpose was not capable to deal with the most important political and social debate that emerged with the expansion of slavery and eventually lead to a civil war. The issue of slavery was indeed the main reason the Whig Party eventually had to collapse according to most historians. North and South were more useful points of reference than Whig and Democrat. The Democratic Party managed to survive in the South by aligning itself with sectional interests and especially the fire-eating secessionist, the extreme pro-slavery politicians who advocated for secession before the Civil War of the Deep South. The Whigs were too hopelessly split and, as a result, disappeared and gave room as previously discussed to the Republican Party. Taking all of the research into consideration is easy to see why the Whig Party was destined for a short existence since it was formed. They were never a true ideological movement nor a true political force. The Whigs were created as an opposition party to Jackson and the Democrats and not a true governing party, once they were faced with a true breaking point they were unable to survive and they were not effective governing the country when they had the chance. The American Whig Party was indeed a short-lived movement that tried to unify the country at a moment when social divisions were at a boiling point.